Hallelujah. God's going to do something, uh, I believe, powerful. He's already started, and uh, God cannot be intimidated. Amen. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is in this house. God, we thank you. Hallelujah. God, we're standing on what you've already declared, not what man God has said. And Lord, we thank you that your word will not return into you void. Sunday, <laughs> God, I thank you for the power of the anointing of the Lord that breaks the yokes. God, that you are reclaiming the earth. Hallelujah. That every single nation shall have a visitation of the Lord. Hallelujah. And that, oh, God, that we are a part of that as you're raising us up as a God portal in the earth. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. While you're standing, turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 18. Didn't our choir do a, a wonderful job? Amen. I want to say thank you for coming out. Um, you know, lots of congregations look for an excuse not to come to church. Just the least little thing, and well, we need to stay home. And you find out they went out to eat afterwards anyway. Uh, couldn't come to church on Sunday, but went to the movie Friday night. And uh, you know, the weather was bad, though the roads were rough, but somehow it was clear to the theater, clear to the restaurant, but every road to the church was messed up. So, thank you that you are not that church. Hallelujah! And um, we're making tremendous progress on our new building. It, it, we do have heat. We do have temporary heat in that building, so it will, it will be fairly comfortable when we go in there and we're beginning to release the Word of the Lord. My goodness, I feel such an unction of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Luke chapter 18, uh, two verses. Um, verse 7, shall not God, this reminds me of the verse where the Lord said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Shall not God avenge his own elect who cry day and night unto him, though he bears long with them? That, that tearing that God does, I don't like it. Amen. I wish God would show up as soon as you pray, but for some reason the Lord likes to just kind of wait until there are absolutely no more avenues, no more solutions, no more able uh, of us able to, to solve our problems. And when we finally just throw up the hands and say, God, you got to do something, then the Lord shows up. Hallelujah. And though, he, I, I, verse 8, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. When he does decide to show up, it won't be a long, drawn-out process, but God will avenge us speedily. Hallelujah. This is what I want to bring your attention to. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, when Jesus comes back in the clouds, this is the question. Shall he find faith on the earth? You can be seated Shall he find faith on the earth? There is nothing that is under attack right now more in the earth concerning the church than our faith. Because if you do not have faith, you cannot advance the kingdom of God. Can you go to heaven without faith? I don't know. The Bible says that the unbelieving will be cast into the lake of fire. The fearful will be cast into the lake of fire. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. But there is a didactic effort right now, a concentrated movement against the people of the Lord in the earth, that if I can strip you of your faith, 
then I can strip you of your effectiveness that you will not advance the kingdom of God. Your prayers will become silent. Depression will begin to creep into your house. Your children will no longer believe in the authenticity of God. Your church will become dead and the enemy will advance. So if there's something that you've got to protect in this hour, it is that God helped me to hold on to my faith. I can give a lot of things up, but you cannot give up faith. When the rubber hits the road, there's got to be one thing that stops the devil in his tracks. When he walks through the front door of your house, when he looks at you and he sees faith, he goes, whoa, I got to get out of this place because faith moves the heart of God. Faith gets a hold of the Spirit of the Lord. God is not able to resist faith in the midnight hour. The enemy will tailor make his weapon against you to come against your faith. It's very unique in the fact that both God and Satan cannot advance their kingdoms without men. We know that God is sovereign, but God has restricted himself within the sphere of humanity that he has to use men in order to advance in the earth. At the same time, the devil cannot without men advance his kingdom. If he could, he would not have to have some of the things that we see in the earth. There would not have to be pornography houses. There would not have to be abortion. There would not have to be prisons because he would just release his evil in the earth. And so what we're seeing in this hour <clears throat> is that there are two armies being marshaled in the earth. One of them is a group of human beings who have decided that we will commit ourselves unto the advancement of evil, and they give themselves over to the enemy, and more and more that's becoming apparent. Evil has lost its shame in America. What used to be hidden behind closed doors is now paraded on the front pages and it's on our internet and it's all over the earth and no longer is there embarrassment but it's it's plotted and at the time when the enemy has a humanity of armies of people that are sold out to him, there must be an army of men and women who at the same time show the same tenacity on the side of Jesus Christ. There is no room for the lukewarm. There is no room for the uncommitted. There is no room for those that just haphazardly want to walk out with the Lord. But you got to serve God with all your soul, all your heart, all your mind, all your strength. God saying, is there anybody in the earth that still got faith in the midnight hour that though the enemy rages, that I've got an army of men that'll hold on to God? The enemy will blindside you. He'll wait to some of your best days and then hit you with tragedy or hit you with the unexpected. My wife asked me last night, she said, what would you have done if our lives had been taken on that plane? I said, well, I'm not sure. She said, I probably would have had to resign the church because I don't think I could have functioned standing before two coffins. But see, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against it. And I feel it's strong in to say this. There are some of you that are in unusual battles. You're standing in places that 
it looks hopeless and you feel great pressure. <clears throat> the very fact that you're under this pressure means that God has confidence in you because he will put no greater burden on you than you can bear. When I used to work in the shipyards and we would put in a fin stabilizer system or a salt water system, fresh water system, oil, whatever, and we had finished all of the wells and all the valves were in, then we would, what we do, we would call a pressure test. We would not do that pressure test until we were sure that we had finished the system. So when we energized that system, we had the confidence that I am putting it under pressure, but I believe that I have created a system that can handle the pressure and that it won't crack it or a valve won't blow or a pipe won't come loose. When God allows the enemy to touch you, it's because he's already the assurance that I have prepared you that it doesn't matter what's hitting you, you will survive this. And what we know does not kill us makes us stronger. And so you have to be able to stand in the midst of adversity and look God in the eyes and say, your grace is sufficient for me. Hallelujah. I believe the church in the last few months has survived the greatest onslaught that the enemy has brought against us. And now it's our turn, hallelujah, to flourish by the power of the Lord. Not speaking explicitly of us, but the corporate body of Christ. For the last three years, hell tried to bury us. But can I tell you, after three days and after three years, there is something called resurrection anointing. That if God did not kill you and the devil buried you prematurely, there's going to come a moment when the Holy Ghost is going to shop with a shovel called the Word of God. And it's going to begin to dig you out. And the dark's going to begin to move. And the enemy's going to going to say, no, no, no. But God, hallelujah, is a grave robber. And God knows how to raise you from the dead and loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon you. Oh, I feel like I can run through a wall. Hallelujah. By the power of the Holy Ghost. See, according to Hebrews chapter 11, faith, hope doesn't make faith. Faith makes hope. Lots of people have hope. But hope that doesn't have faith first never realizes He's talked to people, and 20 years later, they're going, well, I, you know, I'm hoping. Nothing's changed. They're dying in bed. Well, I was hoping. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. And we have a lot of people that are hoping. But unless you have faith, you can hope to you blue in the face and it isn't ever going to come to pass. Faith, hope doesn't create. Hope sees what faith creates. Hallelujah. That's why, see, faith is, might be getting ahead of myself on this. So I'm going to go back for a moment. And it is, this is why most people never really see faith realized in their life because they're trying to have faith in God with their old man. Your old nature will never be able to have faith because the first thing that happens when you use your natural mind, how many of you have said, Lord, I believe it, 
I've got faith you're going to do it, but the whole time you're saying it, it's not coming from here, it's coming from here. <clears throat> then you think, God, why is it not happening? Because faith originates from the spirit man and not, it doesn't uh, work in the old man. Now, the old mind or the carnal mind is enmity against God, and it cannot comprehend the things of the Lord. It will never be able to comprehend the things of God. And so, soon as you begin to try to operate in faith with your natural reasoning, every single time, your natural mind will come to the conclusion that it cannot happen because everything about faith defies the laws of the natural world. The laws of the natural world said you cannot walk on water, but Jesus and Peter walked on water. The laws of the natural world say an axe head cannot swim, but the prophetic, hallelujah, said it's going to swim. The laws of the natural realm say leprosy is incurable, cancer is incurable, but faith says, hallelujah, I'm stepping over into another a realm where faith supersedes the mind and the ability of a man. Faith, hallelujah, is the gasoline of the church. Say, so, well, Pastor, how do we operate then out of the realm of faith? The Bible says this is very clear. In the Old Testament, I think Psalms 82 uh, the, the writer is writing, he said, I said, ye are gods. Then I think it's in, in I, it might be in Matthew, but Jesus is speaking that same thing. He said, did not the word say ye are gods? He wasn't talking about deity. He was talking about the fact that one of the words that they could use for rulers back in that day that governed the lives of men was they were called gods. Because they operated almost in the stead of God. But the Bible gives us some scriptures that tell us that we are similar to God. We are not deity. There is only one man who is deity, and that's Jesus Christ. God manifested in the flesh. But 1 John 4, 17 says this, as Jesus is right now in heaven, so are you and I in the earth. So you and I, when we become a new creation, Paul calls us Jesus' brother. He's the first fruit of many brethren. It's so strange. One moment, he's our Savior. Then one moment, hallelujah, he's our Father. Then he's our brother, hallelujah. One place, he said, I'm your mother. I'm your brother. I'm your sister. I'm your father. He is all things to all men. But the bottom line is this. When you get saved, you take on the nature of, not the deity. You take on the nature of God. And when you become a spirit being who walks in the spirit and not in the flesh, you now have stepped over into another realm that though you live in a natural body, you operate in the divine ability of the almighty God. And when you, Jesus is sitting on the throne and somebody says, heal me, Jesus, while he's speaking it in the heavens, Oh, it's being released in the earth through you, and you begin to operate by the power of the Holy Ghost. I loose the nature of the Holy Spirit in you right now. May God get in your mind, get inside your heart, and put in you the ability to rise up in the Spirit. There's a phrase in the Old Testament and it's referring to a place that we can have on the earth. And it's called, referring, it says the days of heaven on the earth. Before Jesus comes back, 
the church is going to operate in a realm like it's already in heaven. Say, so, well, I don't know about that. All right, let's go back to the Lord's Prayer. Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it already is in heaven, so let it be in the earth. So the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. He's referring to the animal sacrifices and the, and the oblation sacrifices that the Jews were using. He said the kingdom of God is not natural things, but it's righteousness, it's joy, and it's peace in the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> when you go back to the Gospels, there are about 10 or 12 different comparisons that Jesus says the kingdom of God is. It's a vineyard. It's a man to plant it. No, it's a pearly grape price. No, it's, it's where the sower sows the seed. No, it's a woman who took leaven and put it in some bread. Uh, and he just begins to give one example after another. <clears throat> but in the kingdom of God, there are no demons. How do we know that? Because in heaven, there are no demons. Nowhere in heaven right now are there any demonic spirits that are walking the streets of gold. Why? Because it's God's domain. No sin has ever entered into heaven. Nobody ever crosses into heaven with cancer, with Alzheimer's, with arthritic pain. When you get saved, hallelujah, your spirit man becomes rejuvenated. But when you die, you step out of the corruptible into the incorruptible, and you get clothed with a brand new glorified body that's never been touched by sin, that when you walk into the pearly gates. All the Father sees is righteousness, holiness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. So faith is going to take the church of all the things that Jesus could have prayed. That's what he prayed. God let it be on the earth like it already is in heaven. Faith is going to take this church into another dimension. We're already on that journey. Not just us, but churches all over the world. You know, we have a, I think it's Pastor, if I pronounce this right, David Oyedepo. Is it Nigeria? He built a church. I watch him. I have a hard time listening to him because he has such an accent that I, I can't understand him real well. I have to listen really close, but he has such an anointing on his life. He, he built his church, and it seats 50,000 people. And I, if I'm not mistaken, he is already started or getting ready to build another building that seats one million people. That's in, in Nigeria. It's already built. And see, <clears throat> the enemy has hit America with such a spirit of unbelief. So I want to I want to step over for a moment and help us understand what what we are dealing with in this nation. The number one spirit that we are dealing with in the United States of America is a Jezebel demon spirit. It is an ancient spirit. Elijah, they don't even know really where he came from. Elijah, the Tishbite, he just shows up out of nowhere. But he is seasoned in God, yet there is no record of his lineage. We don't know where he's been. We don't know what he's been through. But when God brings him on the scene, he is at such a mature level in God that he is a match for a demonic ancient spirit 
that is ruling in the earth. When God brings Elijah on the scene, his purpose is to reconcile a wayward nation back to their God. A nation that at one time knew who Jehovah was, but now has so deteriorated into idolatry that Israel doesn't know who God is anymore. They are sacrificing to idols. They're burning their children to the god Molech. They are living in the same way that their enemies live in the land. And they are ruled by a Jezebel spirit. But God said, I'm going to break that thing. So he raises up an Elijah man under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. When he came on the scene, he was not intimidated by the spirit of Jezebel the bell that ruled in the area. I break the spirit of intimidation off of this nation in the name of the Lord. I break it off of our voters. I break it, hallelujah, off of our churches. I break it off of our pastors, hallelujah. May God put a back in you by the Holy Ghost and you will rise up in the spirit of the Lord and say you can say all you want but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world as long as you are intimidated by a Jezebel demon it will rule you you will never be effective against it as long as you're afraid of it God brings that man into the season. Requires great faith. It's very interesting that when you look at the increments of time, the dispensations, which really are different time periods and how God dealt with humanity, first one being the age of innocence, we know that because it deals with Adam before the fall, and he does not understand sin. He's innocent. It's not until he eats of the fruit, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that conscience comes in. So now you have this age of conscience where man lives by his conscience. After that, you have the age of human government where man is trying to bring order to his world by just ruling out of his mind. There is a way that seemeth right unto man. There is a way that seemeth right into each man's eyes, but that end is death. So that, that <clears throat> season failed. It brings us to the fourth one. The fourth one is called promise. It starts with Abraham. But the only reason <clears throat> that God brought promise in was because he was now bringing faith into the earth. Where there is no promise, there's no need for faith. When we believe in divine healing, it's because we already have the promise. By his stripes, you're healed. We tithe by faith, even when it's difficult. Because we have the promise that if we do it, God will rebuke the devourer for our sake. We dedicate our children to the Lord and we raise them in the admonition of God because we have the promise that if we do when they're old, they will not depart from it. So, hallelujah. Faith is built on the fact God releases faith into you so that when you get in need, you can go back to the Word and you find a promise that God made to you that's tailor-made for where you are. And you look at that promise and you look at where you're at and then you say, but I'm going to step over, hallelujah, into that world, that unseen thing called faith. And when faith gets a hold of the promise, then God begins to birth the miraculous and the supernatural. My God, we loose faith in this house that the word of the Lord will not return it to him void. 
May God put boldness on us. Hallelujah. May God put boldness on us. May God put a fire in your belly. Some of you need to rise up in the Holy Ghost. Shake yourself off and say, I've had enough of this. I will not be removed by the enemy. But with God, all things are possible. I wanted to read just a, one whole chapter. It's only like five verses. This is in the last chapter of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 1. For behold, the day cometh, realizing now that we're listening to prophecy, that shall burn as an oven in all the proud, and yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that I shall leave them neither root nor branch. This is not the end of the world, because verse 2 says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son not small S, but capital S, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus of righteousness. What's going to happen? He's going to arise. What's he going to do? He's got healing in his wings. And when he comes, there's healing in his wings. You're going to go forth, and you're going to be like calves of the stall. You're going to kick up your feet. David said he makes my feet like hind's feet. Oh, hallelujah. I'm going to get you out of your spiritual wheelchairs and your crutches and your walkers that are limping around in the spirit, saying I'm just trying to hold on. And God said, I'm getting ready to leave healing in my wings and I'm going to spread them out over the house of the Lord and when I do something's going to hit you and you're going to come up out of that thing running by the Holy Ghost verse 3 when he touches you you're going to tread down. That word tread reminds me that we're going to tread the head of the serpent. You're going to tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in that day that I shall do this. This ain't a man prophesying. This is God. Saith the Lord of hosts. In verse, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. <clears throat> the day of the Lord is mentioned at least 23 times in the Word of God. And when Elijah the prophet comes, verse 6, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. <clears throat> when the Lord raised up Elijah to call fire down from heaven, and it brought a wayward nation back to the revelation of who God was. It took a prophet to do it. It took that level of anointing to bring Israel back to the revelation of who God was. Then there could be a transference of that anointing unto other men, whether it was Elisha or Jehu, but they were prophesying <clears throat> on the works of what Elijah had already done in the spirit. What we're seeing, <clears throat> let me try not to get ahead of myself here, but that spirit of a Jezebel is such an intimidating spirit that 
it put Elijah in a cave in depression, wanting to die, and he stayed tired because when the angel came, he had to wake him up, gave him a heavenly meal, and Elijah ate it, and he went back to sleep. Whenever there's an, a Jezebel spirit that gets loose in your life, it will intimidate you. It will make you want to give up. It will make you question your calling. And you will be physically tired all the time and not be able to understand what's going on in my house. That is a demonic spirit of intimidation. And by the anointings of prophetic that's upon me in the name of Jesus, I break every demonic Jezebel spirit off of this house in the name of the Lord and off of the corporate church in America. And I begin to loose, hallelujah, a holy boldness of God begin to get in the spirit of the house of the Lord that we get a hold of this Jezebel demon that rules in our city, rules in our nation, and we pull it down by the power of God, that God can lose his purpose and intent in the atmosphere. Now, we're on a journey here because we find that that's the last thing that God says that he addresses in the Old Covenant. Out of everything he could have dealt with, he addresses the fact that there is a revival of Elijah anointing coming to the earth. <clears throat> we know this, that Elijah did not die. He's in heaven right now. The Bible said he was caught up or translated in chariots of fire as Elisha watched him go to heaven. <clears throat> The first time we find in the scriptures in the New Covenant the mention of Elijah, Jesus is calling John the Baptist Elijah. He wasn't physically Elijah. They asked him if he was, and he said no. But he had the anointing. That Elijah anointing in the Old Covenant made the transition or the leap from the dispensation of law into the dispensation of grace. Why? Because the spirit of Jezebel also made the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we find that spirit surface when John the Baptist is prophesying. What is his purpose? He said, I am coming to prepare the way of the Lord. And he said, the anointing of Elijah is I'm going to make the crooked paths straight. I'm going to fill in the low places. I'm going to bring down the high places, and I'm going to make a straight path for Jesus. Hallelujah. And I'm going to bring a bridge between God Almighty and a Jewish nation that doesn't know that the Messiah is on the way. And when John, the, 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 the Spirit of God hit him, he began to preach out of the anointing of the Elijah that was upon him. But again, that spirit is so strong. It surfaced in Herod's wife called Herodias. She hated John the Baptist because that Elijah anointing dealt with sexual sin. Whenever you study Jezebel, there are, two, there are three major sins that are associated with it. Sexual sin homosexuality, and abortion, or the killing of children. That same spirit is loose right now in our nation. It's rampant. It's no longer something that you hide. People are proud that they've had an abortion. They're proud that their children 
have sexual identity problems and crisis. And, well, I'm going to let them decide if they're a boy or a girl. Listen, a child never fully realizes its cognitive ability until their science says, till they're 25 years old. <clears throat> That spirit came after John, just to show you how strong it is. Jesus said this about John. He said, there has never been a greater prophet ever than John the Baptist. But that thing so intimidated John that when they had him arrested and he's sitting in prison, it made him want to give up. It made him depressed. And it made him question his own calling. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Bible says that he began to question. Was he even right about Jesus? Because he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one? My God, he just a few months before said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. He's baptizing multi-thousands. He buries Jesus in the waters of baptism, watches the heavens open, and a dove like the Holy Ghost sit on him and say, This is my son. But a Jezebel spirit so did it come against him that he is ready to throw in the towel. There is a Jezebel anointing that's trying to make Christians uh, give up, throw in the towel, uh, get depressed, uh, get discouraged, uh, wonder am I called? Uh, is Holy Ghost really real? Uh, is speaking in tongues just gibberish? Uh, listen, you got to rise above that thing uh, by the power of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> History says that when they cut off his head, and brought it on a platter to Herodias, the daughter, or to Herodias' daughter, that she hated John the Baptist so much that she pulled his tongue out and ran a nail through it, just emphatically saying, I won. You won't be prophesying anymore. See, hell likes to nail God's people. Nailed his tongue, nailed Jesus to a cross. But even a Jezebel spirit couldn't keep the Holy Ghost on the third day. Hallelujah. Closing up nail wounds. Can you see it? That is that broken, torn body of Jesus is laying in the tomb. And now we're 30 minutes from resurrection because prophecy has to be fulfilled. The Holy Spirit comes into that dark tomb and looked at those little torn hands where the nails have been in. And he just begins to rub the oil, hallelujah, of the Spirit of God in them. And the wounds begin to heal. And he touches his feet where they've been pierced. And the wounds begin to heal begins to touch his side uh, and begins to get, give him a spiritual massage uh, that when he got done, uh, there was no open wound. Uh, and then he looked at him and said, come alive. Uh, and just like the valley of dry bones, uh, the Holy Ghost uh, released the wind of the Spirit uh, upon Jesus. Uh, he opened his eyes and said, I was he uh, who was dead, uh, but I am alive uh, forevermore uh, and I will not ever be brought under the Spirit of death again Elijah brought a wayward nation back to God John the Baptist was bringing the announcement that the law was getting ready to be fulfilled through the Messiah to a nation that was looking for him but when they saw him, they didn't realize who he was. But now, the Bible says, and all theologians agree with this, that Malachi, the fourth chapter, is not talking about something that's happened. It's not historical. It's something that is yet to take place. And he says, 
before the great and dreadful day of the Lord, he said, I'm sending back Elijah in the earth. And I'm not here to debate the theological sword fights of Elijah and all of that. But I do know this. The Bible says in Revelations, I think it might be chapter 14, that God is going to have two witnesses named Elijah or two witnesses that are going to be raised up in the earth. There are, the Bible says this, there is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. Historically, according to the word of the Lord, the only two men who have never died that still have natural bodies is Elijah and Eni. The reason that I believe that The two witnesses are Elijah and Enoch is because there has to be a marriage or an agreement between these two men because Elijah represents prophecy which we have seen God bring back to the forefront over the last three years. But what does Enoch represent? He had this testimony that he pleased God because he walked in faith. Hallelujah. And so, when you put prophecy with faith. Hallelujah. When faith gets a hold of the promise. See, prophecy declares the promise. But faith, hallelujah, declares that it's going to happen. And God said, uh, there is an Elijah Enoch anointing that's getting ready to be released in the earth in this hour before that great and deathful day of the Lord. No wonder God has already released an Elijah anointing because of the spirit of Jezebel that's loose in the earth. Go downtown Nashville right now. Go to the Parthenon. There is a 48-foot statue of Athena or Jezebel. That is the stronghold of this nation. Oh God, hallelujah, arise and let thy enemies be scattered. Could it be, hallelujah, that there's a visitation in the spirit realm of Enoch getting ready to be released in the house of God? What is that? It's the spirit of faith. Faith is getting ready to get a hold. We're going to grab a hold of the promise of the Elijah anointing. And God said, when it happens, you're going to tread your enemy uh, under your feet. Uh, They're going to be like ashes, uh, and the glory of God is going to be released. Stand with me. Hallelujah. 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 Say, Pastor, why have I had the spirit of heaviness? You're fighting a Jezebel spirit. What is this loose in my house? Why am I struggling? Why is it hard to pray? There is a spirit of Jezebel that's come after you. It's come after the Elijah anointing that's in you because the purpose of God needs to be released out of you by the Spirit of the Lord. If the first Elijah could release a prophetic anointing, that would cause the first Jezebel to be laying in the streets and the dogs ate her. That same anointing is still in the atmosphere. And this demonic spirit that has raised itself up in the earth. See, this, it's not this time about a wayward nation or a nation that's looking for a Messiah, this time, this Elijah prophetic that's being in the atmosphere is about redeeming the earth. Didn't the Lord tell Abraham, nations shall be blessed out of thee. Not just Israel. So that means that this spirit of perversion and Antichrist and intimidation that's in the earth and in our governments around the world. 
God said, there's something in the church that's stirring. Darabobobo Sunday. Hallelujah. Said there's something stirring that this thing's getting ready to be dethroned. Hallelujah. I see, I hear, hallelujah. Listen, <clears throat> you know who took Jezebel down? The eunuchs. Those who Jezebel had in the natural removed their ability to ever bring forth life. And he said, who's on the Lord's side? Who's on my side? They said, we are. He said, throw her down. I hear the Spirit of the Holy Ghost saying to some of you right now, whose side you on? You need to reach inside of where you're living and get a hold of this demonic spirit and tell it, not in my house, not in my city, not in my nation, not in my children. I'm pulling you down by the Holy Ghost. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to what? The pulling down, the pulling down of strongholds. My prayer partners come quickly because the Spirit of the Lord is at work right now in this atmosphere. God wants to break some of you loose today in the name of Jesus. If you're a tither, you're struggling financially because there's a devouring spirit that's loose. If you're fighting sickness in your body, it's because the enemy wants to limit you. If you feel bad all the time. <clears throat> Listen, the enemy didn't want me to preach this message today. I walked out of my house a couple mornings ago. I was going to my outbuilding to pray. And uh, I have brick steps. And I, there was ice on them. And I stepped down. I thought, boy, that's ice. I'm going to be really careful. I stepped down one and stepped down on that foot. And boy, I fell. And the whole side of my body crashed into those brick steps. And I'm laying in the snow. I'm thinking, oh my God, I have just broke myself up. What am I going to do? Find out that well, I'll see if I can move. <clears throat> and I, I was able to sit up because I heard my whole neck just make a weird noise. And I sat up like that I thought well I, don't, I can move it no weapon formed against you I thought God how quickly I could have hit my head on those steps have been in a coma today the enemy hates prophets especially prophets that don't prophesy for self-promotion, but release the word of the Lord. And I'm here today to uncover a Jezebel spirit in the earth. And declare to you, if you're fighting fatigue and discouragement and depression, and you're thinking, am I really called? Did I mess up? Is this really gone? Identify it. Tell the enemy, no. Hallelujah. Hallelujah for the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. <clears throat> so I want you to come quickly because I, I believe that God raises up altars because they're anointed. Come on, real quick. Let's come fill up the front of this church because when you get in the altars, it's almost like where the angel stirs the waters and there's something that's loose in the Spirit of God. Many of you are going to leave today changed by the power of God. Hallelujah. You're going to leave changed if you need a prayer partner. Prayer partner, just keep an eye out for anybody. we got all the way in the front here. We can fill this up. Come on. 
really didn't think we'd have this many people come today. Oh, ye of little faith, because of the weather, I'm so proud of this church. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh, I praise you, God. I want you to slip up your hands. I want you to begin to declare by the Holy Ghost, I break every Jezebel spirit assignment in my house, over my life, over my marriage, over my job, over my finances, over my children. Hallelujah. Lord, we're loosing right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Press in. Press in. Press in. You're going to lead life.